Okay, in this video I want to illustrate how money is created. What we refer to as money is actually book entry cash, uh, sometimes represented by a piece of paper or a coin. Uh, they want us to call this money so we associate it with something that is uh, a commodity something that's not uh, created and destroyed like book entries uh, this represents book entries uh, sometimes it's a piece of paper that doesn't represent any book entries and it's only worth the price of the paper and sometimes it's representing book entries and it's uh, worth a dollar. If you look at the origin of the word money uh, it is from the base word moner or temple um, so money being something that is minted in the temple uh, precious metal so this is going to dispel the notion that um, money is printed out of thin air for instance or created out of nothing uh, it's not backed by anything uh, it's created with book entries book entries are something they're not nothing okay the book entries are specifically a debit and a credit that is a dollar so how that is created is starting with a bookkeeper that we are calling a bank uh, who's not storing anything but uh, books and uh, <clears throat> making vast amounts of wealth so basically money is created when somebody goes into a bank say his name is Tom and asks the banker for a loan and the banker gives Tom a credit line this let's just say hypothetically a thousand dollar credit line and the banker immediately charges Tom a loan fee and now it has created money that it did not have before Now there's a hundred dollars in circulation that did not exist before. So, assuming Tom borrowed the money, which he actually created with his name on a book, to buy something from, say, Bob, like a used car, he, uh, Bob gives Tom the used car. Tom gives Bob nine hundred dollars, uh, possibly in bearer bond bills or a check. So now Bob either has nine hundred dollars in his pocket or nine hundred dollars in his 
uh, bank account, checking account, or maybe he put it in his savings account. Now there is nine hundred dollars more dollars in circulation that was just created that the bank did not have before. Thousand dollar debit, thousand dollar credit thousand dollars in circulation that did not exist before now there's a debt between Tom and Bob and the bank but the only true debt that was supposed to be created was between Tom and Bob the bank was simply supposed to simply provide book keeping services and now the bank starts making the real money by adding debits compounding debits we call compounding interest to Tom's account at the same time adding credits to its account on money that did not exist before. So now Tom has to capture these credits to fulfill his debt with Bob and these to, to fulfill the debt with the banker who didn't have any money before. Bob had a car that Tom now has. And of course Bob can transfer the debt from Tom or the debt with Tom to somebody else uh, by purchasing something from somebody else. We'll say the name is Tim. Now the debt was transferred from Tom to Tim. Tom doesn't even know Tim. And this can go on forever and ever. It's basically a way of transferring debt from person to person. And of course the longer it takes Tom to uh, fulfill the debt by selling something to Tim and the banker, the more the banker is going to make in compounding interest. A money that did not exist before Tom came into the bank to borrow. I want to point out that uh, if you think that uh, a bank has to have a, a fraction of money in reserve in order to loan out or create uh, new loans, new cash. Uh, that makes absolutely no sense because for one bank to have uh, $10 credit, for instance, there has to be $10 debit in another bank. Otherwise, uh, you know, the banker could say, I'm, I just want to shut down and spend my money but uh, of course if he spends this ten dollars that's gonna uh, be inflationary because th this is not actually ten dollars <laughs> it's only ten dollars if a, a person has a debit of ten dollars at another bank that he deposited in this bank so yeah fractional reserve Banking is uh, just another uh, way of obfuscating this fraud. And of course, if Tom goes bankrupt for some reason and is no longer responsible for these debits. without these corresponding credits being wiped out 
these are actually worthless but they're still out there in somebody's account chasing goods and services that Tom would have provided to fulfill his debt that he's not going to provide anymore so these are inflationary this causes inflationary pressure uh, so what's happening is instead of Tim and the bank losing their credits by wiping them out when Tom's debits were wiped out the, the loss is collectivized so if you want to argue it's collectivized by the value of the purchasing power of the dollar going down uh, what we perceive the dollar being worth being worth less every day uh, and the whole producing community taking the brunt of that uh, loss uh, collectively so if you want to argue that uh, collectivism has anything to do with communism or vice versa um, yeah this would be uh, arguably uh, very communistic another example of how money comes into creation is when the government spends it into circulation on uh, infrastructure for instance uh, putting credits into a contractor's account for instance and then debiting the taxpayer debit credit the dollar is always representing a debit and a credit two things at one time uh, and of course if the uh, government doesn't tax out exactly what it spends um, and the debits and credits become uh, imbalanced you're going to have inflationary pressure uh, of course the government can only tax people so much before they really uh, start to uh, grumble so uh, yeah we end up with inflation and then there's the issue of the national debt which is basically compounding debits added to the taxpayer account and compounding credits added to the banker account because we're brainwashed into thinking that money comes from a bank and of course uh, the government can only tax the people so much so the banker can only spend so much before he uh, looks way too rich if he doesn't already and people start to figure out that something is going on but uh, the banker spending this cash on his castles and yachts for instance uh, is inflationary he's not uh, producing anything in turn for what he's extracting from the producing public so what the banker is making from this process is essentially a tax on the producing public uh, and it's not really cash in circulation even though it is cash so uh, because it it was not either spent on infrastructure 
or loaned directly to a producer to be created. So that money that is in circulation, let's just say hypothetically, uh, that this is the cash supply. <clears throat> Different people are circulating in and out of this side and circulating in and out of this side all the time. People are going, borrowing money for other people to capture. And these people are capturing back the money to fulfill their debts. And new people come in to borrow money. Now, if the private banker does not loan out exactly what it or create I should say with new loans exactly what it's taking back in in payments the cash supply shrinks there, there's less cash in circulation per person everybody has less money to spend people lose jobs uh, now you have a, a deflationary depression or a contraction of the cash supply this is the public cash we let private bankers control how much of it is in circulation they can allow a uh, a lot of loans to create a boom cycle and then stop loaning, stop creating to create a bust cycle. And if you know exactly when this is going to happen, you're going to be able to play the stock market very effectively. And of course, because of the current situation, we have uh, unreasonable amounts of defaults on loans, so the cash. The balance between debits and credits is, becomes off and now you have inflationary pressure, more credits chasing fewer goods and services. And until this balances back out, uh, you will have inflation. So one of the reasons there is so many defaults is because of the fact that the private banker is loaning large amounts into existence to individuals uh, that end up going bankrupt. Uh, and then, you know, causing bankruptcies by contracting the cash supply and compounding that problem so the the answer to eliminating the the parasitic banker is basically to uh, shut down the banking industry completely uh, and of course uh, you need a way of getting cash into circulation and uh, and then the current loans of cash out of circulation uh, and we're talking about the public cash so it would be uh, our government's job to create it by loaning it directly to a producer uh, a small loan interest free uh, a loan that would not have to be paid back until the producer retires from the market 
uh, and now you have uh, a consistent cash supply that's not expanding and contracting as the private banker w wills it to um, and no private entity is profiting off the creation of it by charging interest on it. Uh, so you basically want to transfer everybody's savings accounts into a checking account stop the accruement of interest on what is currently borrowed and have the borrowers make payments directly to the government until the balance of their loan gets down to a reasonable amount that they wouldn't have to pay interest on and they wouldn't have to pay back until uh, they retire. Uh, so you're, you're spreading the cash debt evenly among the public. Uh, nobody is in very much in cash debt but uh, or debit to be specific so you minimize defaults that way minimizing inflation and you you spread the loans out to a lot of people everybody that wants one basically that's uh, part of the producing public and you take away the ability of the, the government to play banker and run strictly on revenue that it raises after it raises it not uh, being able to create cash uh, other than through a loan directly to a, a real person and now uh, in order uh, to pool resources uh, what we refer to as banks we would refer to as brokerages uh, because one idea of course is to uh, make banks have 100 percent reserves and eliminate their ability to create cash uh, but at that point uh, you're gonna have defaults and and whoever the depositors in that bank are going to lose so there's no point in not calling it a brokerage and uh, and start pooling all resources by the creation of stocks and bonds and uh, eliminating the savings accounts uh, eliminating the collectivization of uh, defaults at the cost of uh, making private bankers rich and, and uh, being constantly at war. So now that we understand what money is, it's like two things at once, debit and a credit. Uh, similar to a uh, polar polarized thing two things that do not exist without each other now once you comprehend this you can start to realize that uh, the reason that it appears that we have representation when uh, neither of our main political parties or any party on this spectrum in between is trying to expose this banking scam this fraudulent system uh, you uh, can realize that 
our two main political parties are part of a similar polarizing uh, single thing that's that seems to be in conflict with itself but it's actually one thing and the main thing that it's in conflict over is how much wealth to redistribute um, instead of having a flat tax where everybody all producers would be united in wanting lower taxes as their you know no matter what their income level is uh, we have a progressive tax so what you end up with a progressive tax is pressure from the Republicans to lower it as it progresses and the Democrats to raise it as it progresses and then subsequently the oh I got that backwards the Democrats want to make it more progressive the Republicans want to make it less progressive Republicans are pushing down on this end of the progressiveness to make it flatter the Democrats are pushing up down over here to make it less flat no unity just division F fighting with each other over wealth redistribution while the banker commits his fraud Who's the banker of course pulling the strings of both the Democrats and Republicans the banker of course being the force indoctrinating the public into accepting the progressive tax uh, the basis of communism which is what this is the producing public divided while the communist banker parasites that's uh, what communism is if Karl Marx spelled it out it wouldn't work so if we are to bring unity to the producing public to the point to where they can all see what is going on we must have a flat tax or uh, you know a system of taxation that does not tax the producer progressively in any way everybody contributes equally the, or the same percentage of what they produce to the common use infrastructure uh, yeah regardless of their income level and of course for this system to work for the banker the communist banker uh, you must have a huge disparity in income level um, in order to pit the different so-called classes against each other um, thus the uh, you know market manipulation and uh, favoritism that goes on uh, which would be eliminated if uh, if the bank the private bank was eliminated and uh, 
cash creation went directly to the people and um, the pooling of resources was done directly by the producing public. It, the reality is, is there's only two classes the producing public and the parasitic banker but the banker, the communist banker, wants us to think of ourselves as the poor, the middle class, and the rich. So that, you know, we can try to redistribute each other's wealth and fight over how much we redistribute. Thus, we end up with massive poverty and uh, extreme uh, wealth. When the Bureau of Printing and, and Engraving delivers these to a bank, they're pretty much worthless, say, for the cost of the paper and ink and the printing. Uh, the difference between this and this is that this is extremely hard to counterfeit but if you simply do this to this piece of paper I now gave it a fingerprint I could with modern technology I could easily scan this piece and into a computer bank uh, data bank and anybody accepting this could then scan this and make sure that uh, it matched up with this and thus this is not counterfeitable what, what, what gives this any worth or potentially this or the value of the number that's printed on the face of this piece of paper is when a borrower goes into a bank and the banker puts his name on a balance and debits the borrower's account and gives him this piece of paper. Now the borrower can put this into his pocket. This is the borrower's pocket account. <laughs> or buy something from another person and now this is Tim's Pockets account. And of course, these book entries can be represented by uh, electronic book entries uh, and can be transferred with a check or uh, a what we refer to as a debit card or credit card. Uh, Bob having one debit, Tim having a credit. This was worthless until Bob went into the bank and he actually borrowed something from Tim. Tim sells him a candy bar. Tim has essentially loaned Bob a candy bar. The bank didn't loan anything to Bob. Bank is simply a third party keeping books. But because we don't think of the bank as simply a bookkeeper, but a storer of something other than books, uh, the banker immediately starts adding compounding interest to Bob's debit side of his balance and simultaneously compounding credits to his 
personal account. Tim was the loaner, Bob is the borrower, the bank simply a bookkeeper making compounding interest at this point. Tim's not making any interest when he's the one that should be, but the thing is is that he doesn't care because he can transfer that credit conveniently to somebody else. Uh, now, Bob, where he was in debt with Tim, Tim was in debt, now he's in debt with Chuck. Bob and Chuck are in debt. Chuck is in debt. He has a credit and Bob has a debit. And the bank is in debt with Bob also because they have credits that Bob needs to capture these three credits to these three debits in order to eventually balance out and extinguish the debt. So if we were to use logic, we would call Bob with the debits on his balance a debitor, a word that is conveniently not in the dictionary for the banker. And anybody with credits in their pocket or checking account, no more savings accounts, we would call the creditor. Tim and Chuck are creditors. And the third party keeping the books of namely who's a debitor because uh, creditors would keep checking accounts in or paper bills and coin in private accounts or their personal possession. The bookkeeper making keeping track of who is a debitor would simply be called the, the public bookkeeper of the public currency, not a bank. Very deceptive term. And the public bookkeeper would spread the debits among the producing public as evenly as possible with small loans as opposed to large ones that require collateral which is a way of deceiving people into believing that the bank is actually risking anything because when anybody defaults on a loan from the bank currently the bank doesn't lose they simply don't profit as much but uh, the loss is collectivized among the producing public and we experience inflation and we refer to all three of these people anybody with cash debit and anybody with cash credit as a debtor and the public bookkeeper is part of being a debtor. The debitor, the creditor, and the third party bookkeeper are all debtors. So now that we know that the dollar paper bill is simply a representation of a book entry and there is another book entry that it represents the debit why doesn't the banker print up a physical bill representing the debit? And why, when the borrower goes into the bank, to have the banker facilitate a loan, why doesn't the banker give the borrower a dollar credit along 
with a dollar debit well if he did then when the borrower of course goes out and spends a dollar he knows he has a debit and he has to earn that dollar back to combine with the debit to extinguish the debt now if you can picture in your mind these together are not a dollar they're they're an extinguished dollar <laughs> a dollar is actually not what you think it is it's actually whatever you purchased with the dollar that's what the dollar is this is simply an IOU when you give this to somebody when you think you're purchasing something you should give it to them and say now I owe you <laughs> or at least somebody owes you if you're not the person that was issued this directly from the bank so the borrower of course knows he has a debit because he's a borrower but the true lender the person you think you purchased something from but you actually borrowed something from doesn't see himself as a lender because he can easily transfer the debt to somebody else who becomes your lender he doesn't know he's your lender because your name is not on the IOU that's what that's why they make it a generic IOU is because it's easy to fraud people into paying you compounding interest when you don't know that these are just IOUs so now the borrower has the debit and if the if there was physical bills that were debits the borrower would receive in the mail of course more debits over time as the compounding interest accrued now the borrower has two debits in this illustration and of course you'd wonder where do the extra credits come from for me to capture to combine with these debits to extinguish my debt and of course the banker if he was honest he he would have to tell the borrower well when I gave you the debit of compounding interest I put the credit that I create simultaneously with a debit every time I put that in my pocket so I could buy stuff from people who produce stuff like you because uh, I'm a parasite and you're my host so this book entry cache is created when a bookkeeper facilitates loans among producers and when you go to a bookkeeper to facilitate a loan that creates this cash you should always receive the exact same amount of debits to credits and no more debits than you received in credits or your bookkeeper is ripping you off